Ray, Ray, Ray's the one who inspired and instigated this. Uh, she's the troublemaker over here. Yeah. We got this going. Yeah. I, do we start? Yeah, we could start. So uh, this is very exciting. We should, try to, we should try to hold it to an hour, I think. Yeah. And um, what, I, what I figured also today is really also still just an introduction. So last week, we, we kind of got to know each other a little bit and what you're looking for, and if this is a kind of a class for you, um, and for me to get an idea who I'm talking to. <laughs> and then today, um, I also um, <clears throat> wanna just give like a more of an introduction so that we have at least some footing or base of where we're coming from, that we're kind of on the same page in terms of our, our perception of what we're learning. So we decided we're doing the fundamentals of Hasidus based on Chaim Miller's book, the third book which of, of Tanya, which is called the um, Gersa Tshuva. Uh, the letters that the, the author Rebbe wrote to different of his students, his disciples, his Hasidim, his, his, his uh, flock of Hasidim on how to do Tshuva. But Tshuva over there is more like a higher level of the soul, connecting our soul to God. So the reason, remember, we, we, we chose that was because first of all, Chaim Miller explains things very well in his book and anybody can get the book. And I wanted a text that people could read and prepare for the class that would be interesting and that people on their own can study and prepare. And also because I, I got from the woman in the class that they really want something that will they'll give them growth, that they'll co connect mm -hmm. to God. They wanted something that wasn't just so esoteric and nice concepts, but something that's relevant to, to their connection to Hashem. So that's why I chose the, um, the third part of Tanya, which is the Geras Tshuva, which talks about our neshama and how it connects. Okay, so it's, it's very deep. It's actually, I learned this part, one of these chapters of this Geras Tshuva with a very, very uh, special group of women in Israel. Well, actually it was a woman, a shulchas from all around the world, but it was in, in, inspired by a woman in Israel who has this, it's in, uh, unfortunately just in Hebrew, it's called Machon Me'etan. Anybody who knows Hebrew, if you know anybody who knows Hebrew, I strongly recommend you get in the, their program. Because this woman she, who has become my friend, the woman who started this Machon Me'etan, her name is Chana Ruth Avraham. So she took Hasidus, the teachings of the Alter Rebbe, who are gonna be learning his text, um, from Likutei Torah or from my mom and from Tanya, Similar to what we're doing, she called. She made um, um, a, a school called Machon Meitan. Meitan is from the word Tanya. She got it approved by the Israel Ministry of Education, so people who study it are approved as um, to to use this as a method methodology of teaching in the Israeli school system to improve people's lives. Basically, the study was done to see that. The teachings that they're teaching in this Mahometan and the modalities of how they're applying Hasidus into their daily life works to actually improve people's lives in different ways. And they, they you know, and to, to get that through these through um yeah. So she's she's she does it, she trains um shluchos, she's trained um educators, therapists, um people mostly with people with degrees. And she's taught them how to take Tanya and the teachings of Hasidus and make it relevant to how we can um, improve our, our emotional, spiritual, physical, mental system all, all together. But mostly she starts with the, with the emotions and dealing with our emotions and, and being able to um, work with the emotions to get a, a, a godly aspect into the emotions so that we can use these emotions in a godly way rather than in a debilitating way and that's the crux I gave to you about her so she she she's a model of somebody that I I've been following for a number of years now ever since I met her at the the Shluchas convention in Crown Heights the um, a number of years ago maybe six years ago and then um, another um, teacher of mine that I got a lot of what I'm going to be giving over to you Aside from obviously the Rebbe and the Rebbe Sichas, is Rebbe Yitzchak Ginsburg, who I started studying with him when I was 17. So I go back with him. I'm not going to tell you how many years. I don't want to give you my age. So 
But um, when I was a teenager, I was studying in Yerushalayim. I was, I was raised in, I like I told you, hi. I was raised in Israel most of my childhood. So when I was a teenager, Rabbi Ginsburg used to come into Jerusalem from Kfar Chabad, which is an over an hour schlep for him, and teach two classes, one in Hebrew, one in English. So I was I, fortunate enough to be able to attend both those classes every week. And, um, and since then, every time, you know, he's published a book, I've tried to, can't, I can't keep, I have to admit, I, I have not kept up with his books. He has over 100 books in print. But he explains Hasidus in a very, very basic, easy to understand. Well, I shouldn't say easy to understand. You have to, some of his books I've had to study a number of times over. But he does have, I'll show you some of his books. One second. So that you can this, like, this is a book you, uh, just about the 10 powers of the soul. Can you see it or is it out of focus? It's called Hanefesh in Hebrew. So this is an expanded version of the book called uh, The Anatomy of the Soul. And, uh, and, and this book is, is in a smaller version, a condensed version in English called The Anatomy of the Soul that I highly recommend by Yitzhak Ginsburg and that you can get online at inner.org, um, I-N-N-E-R.org. Um, he has another book called Transforming Darkness into Light. This is also the one in Hebrew, but it's the same. The, the same one is in English, Transforming Darkness into Light. This one, this is a book that I actually, I created a whole coaching course based on this book, this book alone. I've created coaching questions for people to go through and ask, journal themselves, ask themselves these questions and answer them. I've done it in groups and to transform our negative uh, feelings and thoughts into positive ones using this modality, a nine-step modality. It's a very beautiful, beautiful format to follow. This, um, let me just see what else, hold on. I'll get you some more of his books, just so you have an idea of some of the amazing books that are available out there. Um, I'm looking for his English ones, okay. Okay, I don't want to take too much time. I want to put time in the class. So there's like, I have all over. His books are precious, precious, precious. Now, not, I, I'm going to warn you though, some of his books were written by different students. Okay, he doesn't actually write the books himself. He, he gives the lectures and then the students write the books. So some of the books are written in like one style and other books in another style. So some are easier or harder to follow and they're different topics completely. So if you get a book that you say, oh, this is way above me, don't give up. It could be that that book was written by a student that that wrote in his style that you don't relate to. Okay, so I'm just, that's just a, a, a preface and a warning. And, and a warning. <laughs> okay, so now, um, so another um, thought system that I've been expanding on more lately, the last, over the last year, a little over a year, I've been delving a lot into the Rebbe's talks from 1990 through 92. Those are the last, what's called sikhas or talks or dvar malchus of the Lubavitch Rebbe before he had his stroke. And those are the most intense and most um, very, very high spiritual, very, very potent sikhas with a very futuristic um, concept of how the world is going to be in the times of Mashiach and how we we make it happen now. So those are very, very um, essential sikhas to be learning. And a lot of my inspiration for like even teaching today was is because I'm learning those those things that I learn it every morning in a, in a Zoom group, which you, anybody here can join that group too. It's, but it's a, it's a text-based book in Hebrew and she goes very fast. Um, I do take notes on that class and I, and I give it out, but it's like, it's pretty advanced. So that's my little introduction. Today we're doing this book, The Practical Climate. This is what we're gonna do in this class. And we're gonna do this class as long as it seems like it's a, it's a good idea, believe it or God willing. If there's any time that I have to, um, one week I can't make the class, I'll either let Ray know, or we can make another little group chat for this class and I'll post it on this, um, for this group, God willing. So did anybody, I have a quick question. Did anybody purchase the book since we spoke two weeks ago? 
Yay, she did her homework. Good for you, Arlene. Yay, Holly. Oh, Mana, did you? Miss Mana. There you are, Mana. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Were you on the first one, Mana? I wasn't. No. Right. Okay. They didn't know. So we figured. So this you could get uh, at the. Uh, I wonder if you could get it on Amazon. But. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, you can get yes. it uh, at iClears or you can get it on Amazon. Okay, fantastic. Somebody maybe mute themselves. Otherwise, I'll unmute you. Let me let me try to mute whoever's. Welcome, Tanya. Yehudi, do you want to make me co-host so I can help with the back end? Yeah, but I'm not sure how to make you co-host. Next to my name, where it says more. Okay. Three dots. You should be able to make me co-host. Okay, let me get your name. Hold on. There you are. Um, I'll click on your name more. Oh, and make co-host. Good. Fantastic. Thank you, Ray. Yes. So you are co-hosting. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Ray's, Ray's the best tech person in the world. If anybody needs <laughs> tech assistance. Oh my gosh. She did it all out by herself. Okay. So, um, my next question, did anybody actually read this book, The Practical Tanya, whether you have the book or not? Nobody started reading. Okay. Oh. Okay. Has anybody read? I read it. I read it and loved it. You read it and loved it. <laughs> I, started, I started reading. Okay. Fantastic. Has anybody read the first part of the of by, that that? Kai Miller wrote this one, The Practical Tanya, the volume one. Anybody here read this, this one? No, I have that one. You have it, good. So this also has a nice introduction at the very beginning of, of Alta Ben General, his life story, how he wrote to Tanya, the, what were the things behind, what he, where he came from, what he was up to, what was the goal, all this stuff. He gives a nice, amazing analysis with lots of dates and lots of names and lots of places and lots of teachers and lots of books. And lots of, that's his, his uh, expertise of Chaim. Nice, amazing analysis. He's, lots the, he's, of he's, and lots of he's, what? A lot of research. Um, Chaim Miller, Rabbi Chaim Miller has done a tremendous amount of research. Very good resource. Welcome, I see some more ladies joined. Welcome, Aviva, welcome, Karen, welcome. Welcome, um, I think that's whoever's joined since I said hello to you. Okay, so welcome. So the, the goal, the goal that, that I wanna do here is to really serve you. I don't have necessarily any agenda of how I have to teach this. This is the first time I'm teaching this part of Tanya. So I'll really mold it to this group and the type of questions that you ask and the kind of things that you're interested in. And, and we can go for there. So it's kind of like, um, you know, a test, a test, <laughs> how do you say, a test drive with this group. Because um, I, I believe the women here are very, very brilliant. And the more you read on your own also, the happier I'll be. The more you do prep work of re reading this book yourself, because I don't have to translate the, this. He's, he's pretty clear. What I'm here for is maybe to take some of the concepts that you want to go through more and explain them better or make it a little bit more relevant. But he, he's a very good teacher, um, Chaim Miller, and it's worth spending the time, you know, on Shabbos, when you have, uh, when you, when you have a quiet moment, when your brain is working well, and, and, and start reading. That's my encouragement. I, I ask you to please do that, so, okay? It will help, it'll help us, everybody be on the same page. So like if somebody asks a question, it'll be you know, more relevant for everybody, but don't hesitate to ask questions. The goal of this class is to be able to ask questions. That was um, Ray's intention that she said, she wants somebody who doesn't mind answering or taking questions to my, the best of my, of my ability. So, so don't feel shy. Okay, so, so the Tanya in general, also there's so many, you know, I've been a Tanya, I thank God I've been blessed to be able to start learning Tanya when I was like 16 years old. So I've been learning it for a long time and I won't tell you how long. And so Tanya, over the years also, I've accumulated a lot of books just about you know, the Tanya itself and about the, the different translations of Tanya over the years. Um, so for years, since I'm a teenager, really decades, I've been learning this book. And every time a, uh, a book 
not every time, but almost every time a book on Tanya has come out, I bought it. This, I, I, I have to tell you, I, Chaim Miller is not listening to me. He's not paying me, but this is one of my favorites. It's really, um, he's compiled from all the books that I've read too, probably, because he does quote them. And then he put the, um, he synthesized them together and gave this explanation on Tanya. So it's very, very um, comprehensive. So, and he even takes also from the notes of the Lubavitch Rebbe and Tanya. So when, when, because the Rebbe did make some comments, commentaries on Tanya and then, and then Chaim Miller incorporated it. So it's, it's, it's a really good resource. Um, in general, the Tanya was uh, published, if you need to know, in 1796. At first, it wasn't published with this part that we're learning, the Aguirre Sachuba. That came later, and it was incorporated later in later publications. Um, the, the reason that Altair said he, he, he wrote the Tanya in general to begin with was because so many people were coming with him to him for advice, for direction, and how to serve God better, how to answer all their questions. He had tremendous scholars, tremendous rabbis, tremendous people, people who had suffered a lot in life, people who were dealing with a lot of, of, of issues, whether it was community, personal, their own inner service, they all wanted guidance in, in serving God. And the Alter Rebbe would take them what's called Yechidus. And at a certain point, it became so incredibly too much overwhelming, the amount and the demands of the people who were trekking to him by foot or by, you know, by wagon and carriage in dangerous forests. So he had, he, you know, he, he gave as much as he could, but at a certain point, he had to put a stop to it and say, from now on, you know, I'm going to send you these, these igros, these like letters, study them and study them with Hasidim who know them better. And because I can't, I can't take the, the number of people are coming to me for guidance. So that's, that's one of the, one of the reasons that the Alta Abba did is, uh, wrote it out. Now the Alta Abba, where did he get his the Chabad Rabbi, the first Chabad rabbi is the Alta Abba, the one who, the author of, of this Tanya. Where did he get his teachings from? So he was a student of Magid of Mezich, he, who was the student of the Baal Shem Tov, who actually they, um, he is, it says that he, I mean, he got from the hidden society of Tzadikim, of hidden uh, holy rabbis, who got it from the, uh, another hidden Tzadik of, uh, of Adam Baal Shem and uh, this, um, you know, I didn't prepare this part, but there were, there was like from um, different hidden holy teachers and who received from, you know, Rebbe to student, Rebbe, you know, passed down in a, like a secret way from the Arizal and from the Rav Bar Yochai. And they were also, it was passed down to them from before them, proceeding from Moshe Rabbeinu and Har Sinai on Mount Sinai. So really the holy teachings of Chassidus were given at Mount Sinai, just like this, but it wasn't taught and revealed to everybody. Only certain individuals who were on a very high level, like the Baal Shem Tov, when he was very little, he was recruited. And it's a beautiful story you could read up about. He was a child in the forest and he was an orphan. And he happened to see a holy righteous person praying in the forest. And this holy tzaddik, who was a hidden tzaddik, hidden righteous person, adopted Rabbi Sol the Baal Shem Tov and took him with him and taught him Torah and taught him the inner dimensions and incorporated him in this holy society of hidden tzaddikim. And then the Baal Shem Tov was given permission when he was 36 from above from, uh, in heaven to reveal it to the masses. And the reason for it was, we all know, a lot of the women here know, and I'm just repeating this for those who don't know, that it was, um, it was because that the people were so downtrodden from all the dif difficulties that were going on in those days of the pogroms and the starvations and the and the persecutions and the hard hardships that people were going through, that there was a lot of um, the, in general the Jewish people in general were in a very low like lowly state of depression and a hopelessness and it seemed that, like Mashiach would never come and they they had just been through Shabbat Tzvi not too long before where they had this false hope of a false Messiah and it was just a hard time. And spiritually and physically also. So um, they had, the, the, the Baal Shem Tov was given instruction that now he can come and teach us stuff. So Baal Shem Tov taught it and his biggest student was the Magad of Mesich who was the, the, the Rebbe after him. And then the, the Rebbe after him was the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov 
afterwards passed it on to his, um, his students. And one of the main students who, I mean, sorry, Baal Shem Tov passed on to the Maggid of Mezrich, the Maggid of Mezrich passed on to the Alter Rebbe. So, and then from the Alter Rebbe, he was the first Chabad Rebbe, from him came all the rest of Chabad Rebbe's until our Rebbe, until us. And then the Rebbe instructed us that we're supposed to continue this chain that we got all the way from Moshe Rabbeinu on Har Sinai through all these holy tzaddikim. It's incumbent upon each and every one of us now to be the conduit to continue it. And he said, we have the, each person in our generation has the spark of Mashiach within him and is a, is a conduit and is able to make through learning Torah and humility and learning the deeper dimensions of Torah and humility to be able to pass this on each person according to their ability is not only can, but is, 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 is supposed to, has to, <laughs> has an has a, has a obligation and a duty to, to share. And uh, there was that especially if we take the teachings of Hasidus and we make it our own, meaning we try to incorporate it into the way we see our, um, we understand it within our, 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 you know, our thought, speech, and deed, but it's, it's taking it in a way that we ex- incorporate it within ourselves in the deepest way, but then try to see how our understanding is, um, is, is not just significant, um, but t- like, basically the Rebbe says, take your understanding and then look for it in the psukim, in the verses. Like, if you understand a concept about how a God's divine providence, based on what we learned in Hasidus, for instance, we're going to learn a concept, let's say, of divine providence, and you understand it in a much deeper, essential way, because Hasidus, that's what Hasidus does. Hasidus is the deeper dimension. It's the secrets. It's the inner dimension. It's like the soul part of Torah. So when this, these soul teachings are passed on to us, it touches our soul, and our soul experiences this teaching. So then we take this experience of how our soul was touched. And then we look in our prayers, we look in the Chumash, we look in the different uh, texts and we understand all the texts of Torah and all our prayers become uh, a different understanding because we incorporated our understanding of Hasidus into whatever we're learning. Okay, so the Rebbe says, that's, that's the goal. That's the real goal. Not just to learn something and be able to just repeat it like a parrot, okay? That like, like many people, I think that's the whole goal of learning Torah is just to repeat what you learn. No, we're not here just to be, you know, processing, you know, processing and spitting out, you know, information, um, you know, like a vending machine. The, the goal is, is to create new insights of our own. That's what the Lubavitcher says over and over again in the last two years, 1990 to 1992. What does it mean to create insights of our own? to take the Hasidus that we learn, that we're gonna be learning in this class and that you learn everywhere else, and to experience it on your soul level, to uh, appreciate it as what it, how it's relevant to your service of God, and then to be able to go into different verses of Torah and see how that teaching applies there. Go into your prayers, see how it applies, see different um, teachings and, or even mitzvahs. A, like a mitzvah has, you know, we do because God commanded, but then, when we understand the inner dimension of Torah, you can understand more reasons of mitzvahs based on your, your, your soul experiencing an understanding of God, like on a, on, on a deep soul level. So you go to a mitzvah, it becomes much more meaningful. So these, uh, these realizations that you'll experience when you're keeping a mitzvah with your consciousness of Hasidis, these are, these are your own insights. And that, this is what the Rebbe says we need to record. We need to write them down. So if you experience the love of God in a, in, a, in a way that you never did before, or you experience the mitzvah of Shabbos in a way that you never did before, based on classes that are here that we're learning now, it's your, it's your duty to give it over to somebody else and, and put it in, either in writing or in video or on uh, audio recording. And keep, keep, these are your insights. This is what the, the Rebbe says. We all have an obligation to redeem our part of Torah. So it's all important for us to understand it to, and incorporate it into our soul personally and try to see it, how it's relevant, how it speaks to us. Okay, so that's, um, I have on YouTube also, I, I've been teaching this from, it's, this is, the Rebbe talks about it in last week's Parsha and the week before that and weeks before that. So I post that on YouTube on the Beis Chana channel. 
these, these concepts. So you can go back there and I speak about it more at length. Today I'm trying to condense everything so that we can like try to just get through a, like as much as possible of an introduction so we can actually delve in more inside um, in, the, in the book um, itself, in the teaching itself. Um, okay, so I'll give another quick overview in general. We said Tanya was, was in general letters to people to try to answer questions that people kept on asking about there. But now I'll give you a, one more of my personal insight. One of the things that I see, the themes that the Alter Ebbe addresses in, 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 in all his, um, in the Tanya, I've learned Tanya quite a few times because like I said, I've been learning it since I'm 16. And we, we do finish the cycle of Tanya, the whole four books of Tanya in every year. Um, it's divided up to the, each day of the year. So who, for those who don't know, it's a good thing to get into that cycle. And then even if you don't understand it so well that day, you'll still, after many years, you'll maybe understand it, okay? <laughs> but there is, there's this concept of protection also that the, um, I just saw a video clip, somebody who was Nachabad many years ago was very ill and he wrote, um, to 20, they, the, or the family wrote to 23 righteous, holy, big, um, prominent rabbis of the generation to pray for this person um, or to ask, no, to ask, what was it? To ask whether he should do um, a surgery or not, because there was a, a, a brain surgery that was posed, but it could create that, it could cause him to become a vegetable. So, um, 23 letters were written, only, only one was responded to, only one tzaddik, one rabbi responded, and that was the Lubavitch Rabbi. And the Lubavitch Rabbi told, um, told them that, uh, that, he, that, that this person should learn chitas, which is the, included, one of the parts of it is learning the portion of Tanya of the day, every day, as it's divided to the days of the year. And it's, you know, you can go on Chabad.org and, and, and get that. So what happened was the, they wrote back to the Rebbe, but the Rebbe, you know, this person is not able to, to study Torah at this point. They're not in the state, you know, they're not well enough. So, okay, let me just turn this off. So the Rebbe said, well, well then their child can, can learn for them. My child just called, uh -huh, he's learning for me. Um, so, so, so they said, no, he's a Holocaust survivor. He has no family. There's nobody who can study for him. So the Rebbe said, then a friend can take it upon themselves. A friend of his can take it upon themselves to learn the chitas, the, the portion which includes in it the portion of Tanya of the day as it's divided to the days of the year. And so um, somebody, I guess, did. I guess whoever was asking it for them did it. And the person got better. Okay, they didn't... Um, uh, they uh, they got all better. I think that's I think it was the, the one with the surgery. I, I hope I'm not confusing two stories. But for sure, the person wasn't well, wasn't well enough to study, didn't have relatives, didn't have children, um, and couldn't study themselves. The family couldn't study. Somebody took it upon themselves to study, and within a few weeks, that person got better. I, and I'm pretty sure it was surgery. Maybe it wasn't. If if it may have been another disease, and I'm mixing two stories together. But whatever it was, the person got better. And um, that's just like one little small story of many. There are many, many times and many answers that the Rebbe gave to people, the Lubavitch Rebbe in our time, and answer people to take on the study of Chitas, which includes in it the study of Tanya, and on a daily basis for their, to help them in life. So that's, the power of this is, is, is intense. The power of learning it is immense. And I'm so, I'm delighted that we're, we're actually going to do this. This is amazing. Good for me. Makes me have to study this again. I'm very, very grateful. And also whenever people ask questions, it makes me work harder. So it's a wonderful thing. So how much time do we have? Let me just see what time it is. Six. Oh, good. Okay. So, um, for those who came who came in in the middle, before I keep going, we're doing this uh, practical Tanya. I want whoever wants to be part of this group. Really, really, I'm I'm asking you to please borrow or buy 
the book, The Practical Plan. You can get it online on Amazon and it's and to prepare to read it as much on your own before this class. And um, you'll get more out of the class and you can ask better questions and when you have it. But it does a tremendous job here. So I'll read to you quickly just a little bit of stuff. Since I don't, only one person here said she has actually maybe even read it. Um, this I told you already. Okay, so it's a relatively small book of just 12 chapters, this, this volume, volume three, which is the Letters on Repentance. Letters on Repentance is far longer than one would expect from a letter. Um, so it, doesn't, it does not appear to ever have been even sent as a letter. The name therefore invites some interpretation. So in one of the talks, the Rebbe offers two insightful explanations. Practically, the letter is a guide to spiritual recovery. Okay, I like that. <laughs> Spiritual recovery. The restitution from a state of sin. So a state of sin is like a spiritual illness. Recovery is not supposed to be a permanent activity. You recover and then you move on. Therefore, the work was named a letter to emphasize its temporary status. For unlike a book, one generally disposes of the letter after its use. The mystical, the dynamic of chuba is a process of reinventing oneself through drawing on transcendent energies, okay? You're gonna be learning here that I was saying, how to draw down transcendent energies. In the language of Kabbalah, Teshuvah is powered by Bina, which is the divine womb from which the energies that conduct the universe are born. Teshuvah brings a person to be reborn by channeling fresh transcendent energies from Bina. This is um, from the Zohar. A letter has the specific connotation of content that has been sent from one place to another. To Shuf, what the Rebbe suggested, resembles a letter which sends healing energy from energies from a distant transcendent place, which is what we said, Bina, down to the penit penitent on earth. Um, meaning through teshuva, what we're going to learn here, what teshuva is, and it's an ascent of our soul and our return to God, we draw down these healing energies from this level called bina, down to earth. Now, this third part of Tanya is a discussion of the theory and the practice of teshuva, repentance, both from a legal Talmudic, you'll see at the beginning there's a little more legal Talmudic stuff, and from a mystical perspective. And that's the main thing we're going to focus on is the mystical part. Now, the letter builds a vast rabbinic and Kabbalistic literature on the topic and seeks to guide the reader on a path of tshuva that is fitting for the emerging Hasidic movement. One of the major innovations of the Kabbalah's treatment of tshuva is an emphasis on the spiritual damage that it is caused by sin and the corresponding healing process or properties of tshuva. So it's basically, this is a book of telling you how to heal if you've if, God forbid a person brings um, unholy, unhealthy energies into their life that they want to let go of, this is the formula of how to bring down the energies that will wash it away and reconnect the person in a much deeper way to godliness. One of the major innovations, okay, this I read, the Zohar teaches, if a man opens a pit or if a man digs a pit, this is a, you know, Torah law, and an ox or donkey falls into it. There's like definitions of what, you know, he needs to be done. What, what's written next? It says the owner of the pit shall make restitution. If such is the case in this situation, all the more so with one who harms the world by, by their sins. Teshuvah restores everything, repairing above, repairing below, mending oneself and mending the whole world. And the principle is explained beautifully by Eliyahu Vidas in his Reishis Chochma. Reishis Chochma is an ancient text. And he writes like this. The word teshuva refers to the intention to restore previous levels and repair them to their original status. This can be compared to the removal of water flowing from a fountain. In order to nourish various gardens, orchards, fields, and vineyards, along comes some fool who diverts the channel of water towards the trash or to some empty place where it serves no purpose. 
the owner of the fountain will be angry at him for, because he caused this watering of his fine gardens to be stopped. And secondly, because he spoiled and broke the original channel. So the consequences of actual sin are much more grave than in this case. For if one spoils the channels of the divine flow from coming to their appropriate places by diverting them, he has angered the king, the king God of hosts. He takes holiness and diverts it to impurity, causes a place that should be dry and barren of support of waters and saturates it. Shuga repairs these broken channels, restores the flow to its proper place and everywhere according to the, to, according to the, the flaw with everywhere according to the flaw within him. So by the way, I just wanted to make sure to remember to tell you, and I'll probably remind you this throughout uh, more times, is that the, um, when we say that, so when we're talking about sin, so really, first of all, in, in our generation, most people were raised either without Torah to begin with and not knowing what is right or wrong or what Torah wants or doesn't want, or even if they were raised um, in a Torah observant home, they maybe were, even then they weren't necessarily taught it properly. Okay. <laughs> um, if, if Torah was taught from a place of you do it out of fear, fear of punishment or fear of, um, you know, it, 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 if, if God was presented in a, in, um, as an angry, vengeful God, who's going to, you know, hurt you if you do something bad, that is not, then Torah wasn't presented to a person in a very healthy way and in the correct, truthful way. And the person is not as culpable for their sin as a person who had uh, an amazing, amazing, clear, um, you know, like the Jews, let's say at Mount Sinai, when they were taught the Torah directly from Moses at Mount Sinai, that was a different generation. We're in a generation that suffered a lot of um, trauma and trials and tribulations for many, many generations. And a lot of the teachings that we've gotten um, have been either non-existent or skewed. So our understanding of God and understanding of Judaism, understanding what, what, what's right and wrong to do has not been taught us properly. So when we're trying to, to do teshuva, we have to have that in mind that most people in our generation don't even fall into this category of what he's talking about, but still this is very valuable because it gives us the blueprint of how, yes, how to bring new channels of energy to connect to God from, um, in, in a wholesome, healthy way, okay? So here we go. Some more. I, I'm wondering if you could see me with all this um, light, the way it is in my face and the, the shadow and everything. Am I, are you able to see me fine? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. Okay, good. So I'm reading a little bit more. This is beautiful stuff. This is for a, a key passage in the Zohar explains the different levels of tshuva. There are many types of tshuva a person can do, all good, okay? But the, and they're not identical in character. One person may have been a complete wicked human being all his life, transgressing many prohibitions, but subsequently he regrets his actions and confesses them. Afterwards, he does neither good acts of kindness and charity nor bad transgressions. Such a person will certainly be forgiven by the Holy and Blessed Be, but he will not merit upper teshuva. So one of the major things that he's going to talk about in this EPRS teshuva is this level called upper teshuva. Another person, after repenting of his sins and achieving atonement, will follow in the path of the commandments and devote himself with all his abilities to revere and love the Blessed Holy One. Such a person will merit lower teshuva called returning the hay of the tetragrammaton, this is lower teshuva. And we're gonna go into the letters of the tetragrammaton and what's, what was damaged and what's restored, meaning the, 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 the damage of, of being disconnected is, creates a damage in God's name also, the tetragrammaton and the channel of flow is blocked. So that's, we're gonna deal with it when we go inside. And then the, there's a third person who, after regretting his sins and re repenting, studies the Torah with reverence and love of the Blessed Holy One with the expectation of reward. So that's still not 100% complete because the person's doing it for the reward. Such a person will merit the letter Vav of the Chitrogrammaton, who is the son of the Yudanahe. And then the Vav is called the son of Bina, since Bina is composed of the world Ben plus the letter even Hey, and this person will cause Vav to return to the first Hey, etc. That is why the word Teshuvah means return the Vav to the Hey. Letter on repentance is largely built on this passage from the Zohar. 
Um, and he's, this passage I just read you about the hay and the vav and the yid, that's what this whole book is, a lot of it is built on, explaining this flow of energy from um, above to below and below to above. And we're going to go into that. So this, um, Rav Shir Zalman seeks to clarify the meaning of these two levels of the upper tshuva, the lower tshuva, both in terms of the mystical processes that the Zohar is talking about and their practical implementation as states of consciousness. Okay, we could be in two steps, in two, uh, we can be in many states of consciousness, but here he's talking about two um, very significant states of cautious, consciousness that a person can be at a lower level or high level. Chapter four to seven expounds upon the Lord Yeshua, and chapters eight to 12 of this book, they focus on this upper Teshuva. Okay, so there's base Teshuva, what's called lower Teshuva, and then there's upper Teshuva, which is a little bit more of an ascent of the soul and a more spiritual um, elevation of the soul. Then um, a lot of, uh, at the beginning of this book also, uh, the, the, the Rebbe is gonna talk, and I'm gonna try to concise it a little bit, um, but there's, it used to, people used to think that if they wanted to repent and come close to God, that they had to fast, okay? And people, because there is one source that talks about uh, different fasts that you do for different sins. So people were taking it to very, 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 you know, seriously and fasting and fasting and fasting and fasting, hundreds and hundreds of fa fasts. And um, so the author ever puts into context what the role of fasting is when he when he deals in this book, and we're going to go into that. Um, which, by the way, I'll give you a little teaser, a little taste. As Alta ever says, you could always redeem a fast with charity. You know, you give the equivalent of a fast day or what you eat for the meals of, of during the day to charity. So that's um, I'm just giving you a little taste of what's what's to come. Um, also, the, the altar became very much against self-mortification. In those days, also, people thought that if you, you know, tortured yourself a little bit, self-mortification, as it was called, it was a little popular in, in Europe in those days, um, that you would be more holy and more, and your repentance would be accepted. And that's one thing also. The altar came to um, take away these notions that this is the way to serve God and disprove them. Um, I'll bring you a quote from Zev Wolf of Zhidomir. He writes, um, I have heard that in the days of the Baal Shem Tov, there was such a person who engaged in self-mortification. And the Baal Shem Tov said that in the world to come, they are laughing at him. For the truth is that all of this is not necessary, particularly when one's, when one's heart is lacking in essential worship, namely the Vekas. I mean, we're, the goal is to be cleaving to God, not to be, you know, in pain and suffering. Now, in our days, people don't do so much self-mortification, but some people do it on an emotional level. So that's my little insight over here. This is my own little interpretation. We maybe don't torture our bodies, but we torture our emotional system, right? With guilt and shame and blame and feeling um, the excessive amounts of, of shame and blame and guilt that are not healthy, that actually take us away. You know, so we flog ourselves emotionally and think that we're actually gonna become better people if we torture ourselves <laughs> with feeling bad about something. And that also, that there but disproves that that is not the way to come this shuba, to, 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 to close to God. Um, and the, another quote, was written to this tzaddik, this Jidome. You write that you are forced to fast, and my innards grew angry from that what I read. And he also wrote, I hereby add by a most holy oath that you must not endanger yourself in this way, for this is a depressing and sad act. Godliness will not rest where there is depression, but rather where there is the joy of a mitzvah. So that's a very, very important point. And that's in also in the first part of Tanya, you see the, the author of it devotes a lot of chapters into trying to help people realize, be a little bit more um, um, also, not to have these huge expectations of themselves, that they have to be these holy, righteous people who never have any temptations to sin. And, and he puts into context more of what, what it means to be a human being and what God expects of us as a human being in this physical world. 
So that's a lot of that, that is dealt with in, in the first books of Tanaim. He's talking to very righteous people, people who intended very well, wanted to be holy to deacon, and they were mortified when they saw that they were just humans. So nowadays, we, you know, a lot of these ideas of Hasidus are permeated, and we know them already. But um, um, in the times of Alter Rebbe, it wasn't. People would just just felt really terrible, and the Alter Rebbe had to come and 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 stop these things because. People are becoming very depressed and sad. And the goal of serving God is to serve God with joy and pleasure. And, and the more joy and pleasure and delight we have in, in serving Hashem, the, uh, really the more spiritual and holy we are. And that's really the goal of Hasidus. Delight in serving Hashem, serve God with joy and delight. So, you know what, I should stop. <laughs> yeah, that's the goal, if, if there's any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me okay? Because sometimes my my Wi-Fi gets wonky. Um, what I what I don't understand is why this is isn't taught for all Jewish children. Like, and maybe this is not a discussion for now. But what do the misnagdim have against this? Because from what I'm reading, who wouldn't want to know a good way to to do teshuva? So I guess my question is that there are different opinions and and people who are against teaching this do i have that correct or um I, I personally don't know anybody who's against it i i think nowadays it's become much more mainstream but i could be i could be mistaken um it's 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 just not everybody just knows it not everybody's taken the time to necessarily study it i have actually nowadays in more later years now we can there has been more than enough books, the, these teachings to, to the level that even children can study. I've seen it in school with pictures and, you know, diagrams and things written, you know, okay, so I think I have one here. Okay. Um, no, no, I don't have it right now. But there's, if you, especially in Israel, I've seen it published Different, like you know, like pamphlets, not not necessarily so for schools. In in the Israeli school system, they have a lot more on Tanya. Colored pictures, colorful pictures, really, really, you know, well, well. Um, I haven't seen it so much in English. <laughs> it's time. Maybe it's there, and I haven't seen it. But yeah, it needs to be taught in the schools and everywhere. Definitely, the more it's taught, the the better society will be. But I'm sure there are. You could Google it. I'm sure there's, there's, you know, I, ha I haven't been in the school system teaching for a long, long time, so I don't know what's available. I'm sure there's stuff available. Is there any other questions? Okay. So I'll continue a little bit more. Oh, yes. Are you able to tell us? Um what page or chapter you're reading so we can follow with you? Yeah. Oh, you you have the book, right. Okay, so I was reading from the introduction. Today I said we'll just do the introduction. Um, what page I'm on? Um, I did I didn't read everything. I, I, some of it I said out, you know, outside and some of it I read it inside. Um, I'm on page, oh boy. Um, X V I I. <laughs> okay, do you know where that is? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to start from the top. Um, they were, the Hasidim who were like from the times of the Baal Shem Tov, at least, I'm talking from the top of the page, at least in the tiniest formulation, did not reject fasting outright. It followed a more nuanced approach. Early Hasidim, it turns out, Hasidicism, it turns out, was somewhat encouraging of fasting and saw great spiritual benefits to the activity. In those cases where it would not compromise health. Needless to say, the letter on repentance does not constitute an exhaustive treatment of the topic of teshuva, a theme which is expanded upon greatly in the later discourses of Reb Shneur Zaman and his successors. The seventh Lubavitcher ever made teshuva a central theme of both his public discourse and communal work, and he vigorously encouraged the study of this book, The Letter of Repentance. 
often advising that it be studied before the other parts of Tanya. Okay, so by the way, I oh maybe I didn't say this, but yeah, I don't I didn't tell you this. Um, after we had our class, was it after we had our class or before we had this class? Miriam um, Yerushami wrote to the Lubavitcher, she opened up Rebbe's letters, she wrote him a letter and she told him about the class that we were teaching together. We taught together a class of Lunch and Learn. And she got two answers in English and she sent them to me on WhatsApp. One answer was like, oh, Rebbe was so happy and pleased to hear what you're doing in Los Angeles. And it was all these blessings. I, I don't remember, this is already almost two weeks ago. This is right after, I think this was the next day after we had our class two weeks ago, okay? So, so Miriam sends me these two WhatsApps and one was all, all these blessings for what we're doing in Los Angeles. And then the next letter on the same page was about, the Rebbe was saying, I'm glad to hear that you're teaching the Geras Hatshuva, the letters of, this is the book of the third part of Tanya. And the Rebbe says, it's also a very great thing, a very good thing. You know what, I, I'll read it to you from my phone. I have a copy of it on my phone. Because I was, I, I got so excited because I didn't even write to the Rebbe. Because remember, we didn't know what we were going to study like two weeks ago. We were trying to figure out what to study. And then at the last second, right before we ended the class, um, you know, I was saying, why don't we learn Rebbe Miller's? It sounds like, a, you know, that could be easy for people to read. And then I, I thought of Aguirre Sachuva because, yeah, because everybody wanted to connect to God. And this is like a really, you know, nice way to connect to God. So, so, so that's how we ended the class. And the next day I got this answer from Miriam Yershami telling the Rebbe about what we're doing in, in LA. And the Rebbe was saying he was very happy that we're teaching Iger Satyashuba, this book, this third book of Tami. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know what, I, I got so excited. I'm, I'm glad I remembered <laughs> to share this with you because it was very like prophetic of the Rebbe to tune in and give us this blessing for this class. So I'm, I'm going to find her. Here it is. And it's in English, so I can read it to you. As long as it doesn't keep moving around. Um, so it's like this. Um, although this comes at the end, it is not because it is, God forbid, less important than above, or perhaps it is even more important. Than it. it is that, I hope, a regular study of the Geras Hatteshuva. This is it has been started either in the original or in the translations, like we're doing with translations. At present, there are translations in Yiddish, English, and French, and soon there will be an Italian translation. For the important thing is the study of this work and its contents, not the language in which it is studied. To those who may need an additional stimulation in this direct direction, you can relate that during the last Yudtes Kislev for bringing an Inkva Chabad, with the participation of President Shneur Zalman Shazar, the president, in his concluding speech, he urged all present to undertake the study of Iger Satashuva, this book, okay? Um, stating that he himself has a regular shear in it. Okay, so if anybody thought, you know, had any doubts that we're supposed to be learning this, it became very clear, the Rebbe said, very clearly right away the next day, and apparently the Rebbe said it many times, and I did remember, when I, when, when we also, when we were thinking of doing this, I remembered that the Rebbe did say, you don't start Tanya in its order necessarily. You don't start Tanya from the first, uh, the first section of Tanya, this book. When you, when somebody's learning it for the first time, it's better not necessarily to start it. We do, when we do in the order of the year and we learn a little bit each day for protection, you know, and for, to stay up with it, we start from here. But when a person's studying in depth, kind of get the fundamentals, we start with the third part of Tanya, which is what we chose to do last week. And we got our little um, answer from a book called The Letters of the Rebbe, and it's in English. And uh, Shner, Shner Zalman Shazar, the president of Israel, he had a shear in it. Isn't that great? <laughs> We're, um, the seal of approval. Yes, seal of approval. I, I, I told Ray about this right away. I saw Ray. I'm glad I remembered to share it with you. Okay, so there's four more minutes. Any more questions? Can we see your notes, Ray? Are you going to post it? Should we make yeah. a little? Should we make a little WhatsApp group for this class? That's my. I have a question. 
Ray, do you want to make like a little WhatsApp group for this, the women in this class? Um, and then post your notes each week and we'll post it, but like a we could, I can't make it or something or whatever. Or we're, yeah, you know. we could, we could do okay. that or um, maybe um, uh, you already have an art notes class, so maybe we could do it there. So know, yeah. Either way, I don't know if people want to join another group or if it's something that's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, it just, there might be a lot of little updates that might annoy people um, if, if it's a bigger group. Oh, yeah. So you share your notes. Or like uh, dates and things. Or yeah, like if, like if I'm out of town or something and I can't teach this, I don't, you know, this could be just more of like, um, and if somebody has a question on the class, they can also post it on the chat. Okay. Is okay. this showing? Um, is this showing the correct direction or the opposite? Yes, direction? it's showing the correct direction. It looks beautiful. I love your it's funny uh, kind of right. setup that I Mickey Mouse here. Well, we'll leave it up to you. So we still anyway, now... post it. Yeah, I can't really. You want to? You want to read it to us? Um, you know what's what's so interesting. This is what I love about art notes, and journaling, is that um, last week I started this this graphic here, right? So mm -hmm. what does that remind you of? The downflow. The downflow of energy. And hair. And hair, <laughs> maybe water. To me, it looks water. like water. Started, it started just taking the of water. Yes. So I just had done this, basically just this graphic last week because we didn't really study last week. So then you gave, <clears throat> you know, I really only put down one main thought from today make the teachings of Torah and Hasidus, which is the soul of Torah, your own. Share your Torah insights with others. Teshuva channels healing transcendent energies from Bina. So then this graphic was, oh yeah, that kind of looks like, you know, channeling healing energies from Bina. Yes. And then you tell that beautiful mashal, the parable about the king has a beautiful garden. He waters the garden from a stream. A fool comes along and diverts the stream to water a garbage dump. How do you think the king feels? The fool recognizes his mistake and restores the flow of the channel back to the king's garden. This is Teshuva. And again, this graphic that I did last week, you know, from the subconscious, it kind of illustrates that the flow comes down, it gets diverted, and then comes back down to water the garden. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yes, so we have one minute left. So there is, and I, I do recommend you go to my YouTube channel, Beis Chana, because there, if you want to get also the a lot of these inspiration things from the Lubavitch Rebbe about our, how to get access to our highest parts of our neshama, that's, that's in those talks from 1990 to 1992 of just like, he explains how the whole creation of the world, it's all channeled through the, the, the Torah. And then the Torah is channeled on the deepest levels through the inner dimensions of Torah to the deepest parts of our soul. Torah is channeled, the 10, Torah was given the world was created with 10 sayings, and then Torah was given with 10 commandments, and then our neshama has 10 powers. This is all the downfall of channeling, the power of creation through the power of Torah, through the power of, our, of God's spheres, from the God's, God's spheres, from God's spheres to the creation, of, the creation of, of heaven and earth, to the channel, through the channels of Torah, we draw it down into the holiness, into our consciousness, of our 10 powers of our soul. And then through our 10 powers of our soul, we can actually change the, our, 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 our soul and the world. Now the highest levels of these energies, the deepest levels of these energies is the, is the inner dimensions of Torah. What I just said about the 10, 10, 10, 10, that's all aspects of Torah. The revealed Torah and with all its dimensions. There's a very good book for also I recommend for whoever was at the beginning, is stages um, called on the essence of Hasidus, and it explains more what Hasidus is. I was thinking that this whole class, I would just explain what Hasidus is, but because we have women who already know and women who who are already been learning Hasidus for many years, I didn't want to do that. But if whoever didn't study this book on the essence of Hasidus, I highly recommend it because then you'll have a little bit more of a appreciation and context of what we're learning. So you can either come from like getting it, you know, and then discovering and expanding your horizons, or you can you be coming to this from, you have the expanded horizons, you have the background and we're, come, we're honing in. So you can come from either direction, or you'll all get something very wonderful learning this text, but the more on your own you do study, prepare, 
research, what is Hasidus, what is Tanya, what is Teshuvah, what is, you can do a lot of this on your own. Okay, so Ray wanted me to end and it's 6.31. So I try to be a good, a good listener. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yehudia. Thank you. It's a, it's a good beginning. Okay, yes, yes. I try to make it, try to make it easy on my students. Not too hard. Right. Okay, thank you, Ray. Thank you for taking those notes and, and yeah, and we'll, hopefully you'll make us the WhatsApp group. Yeah. And post it for us. Thank All right, you. I'll let everybody know. Thank you, Ray. All right, thank Take you. Care. Be well, everybody. everyone. Uh -huh. All the best.